If you're watching this video, chances are you know we just got a new trailer for the sequel to Breath of the Wild. If you didn't know that, you probably should go watch it. Anyway, after two long years of waiting, we got to see some gameplay of the sequel, including new monster types, new weapons, and more footage of that mysterious glowy hand we've been so obsessed with for two years. Perhaps more important than all of that, though, we were shown a new area that we'll be able to explore, the Sky Islands. We don't have an official name for this area, and truthfully, we don't know a whole lot about it either. However, just from the trailer, there's a fair amount to talk about. So, today, I figured why not do a theory about what could be up with the islands. Specifically, I want to examine how they relate to Hyrule and what we might end up seeing there. Let's get right into it. First off, let's take a look at some floating islands from previous Zelda games. It's clear that these aren't exactly like any place we've been before, but for the sake of comparison, it's good to know what we already know. Skyward Sword probably features the most floating islands to date, with most of them being pretty small. The biggest island in that game would be Skyloft, home to the Hylians, which was sent up into the sky by Hylia. The sky in this game is a lot like what we saw in the recent trailer. It's directly over Hyrule, and it's made up of several islands. In the trailer, it also seems that there's some separation or distinction between these two areas. While we can see Hyrule from the Sky Islands, we can't see the Sky Islands from Hyrule. This reminds me of the Cloud Barrier in Skyward Sword. In that game, a barrier of clouds separated the two areas, and from the ground, the sky looked perfectly empty and normal. However, unlike in the trailer, you couldn't see down through the barrier, so this is likely a bit different. Beyond the weird separation of the two areas, these seem to be pretty different places. Next, let's quickly go through some other examples of floating islands. In the Minish Cap, there was a tribe known as the Wind Tribe, who lived on cloud islands. They managed to live up on these clouds because of their mastery of the wind, hence their name, but these don't seem to be quite the same kind of island. However, some of their structures are a little bit like the ones we see on the Sky Islands, so it's possible there's a connection there. The cloudy type of islands have also been seen in Four Swords Adventures in the Palace of Winds. In Twilight Princess, we encounter a city that flies using propellers, but that's not what's going on in the trailer either. The only other games I can recall with islands like this game would be Four Swords and Triforce Heroes, where unfortunately we get very little information about the floating islands themselves. So Skyward Sword is definitely the best point of reference, but even then, this game seems to have an all new set of islands. On that note, let's analyze the islands in the new trailer. These islands seem like pretty sizable chunks of land, and not just places from Hyrule cast into the sky. Instead, these islands hold entirely new ruins, with distinct foliage such as the exclusively yellow trees. The ruins particularly seem to be a pretty big part of these islands. Many of them have these large, pointed columns, which remind me somewhat of giant teeth, and in a couple places you can see absolutely massive structures in the background. The gateways on these islands resemble tori, which based on a 30 second Wikipedia run, seem to mark entrances to sacred places, like shrines. That likely means there's something special about this place, whatever it is. And of course, we see these little egg-shaped decorations in many places. All of this is pretty interesting, and I'll get to why in just a minute. As I mentioned earlier, it seems to me almost as if there's a barrier between the sky and the surface. Otherwise, I don't quite understand why these sky islands wouldn't be visible from the surface unless they simply weren't there yet. However, there's so much up there with so many massive structures and islands that I have a hard time believing they just moved in. Time travel is also a possibility, but at the moment, I'm still not too sure the islands are a direct result of that. So, for the purpose of this theory, I'm going to suggest there's some unseen, one-way barrier between the surface and the sky islands. But if that were the case, you would expect there to be some way to pass through the barrier, right? Some gateway between the sky and the surface, like the beacons in Skyward Sword. Allow me to introduce to you the Dragon Portals. Dinral, Feroche, and Nadra are three spirits who watch over Hyrule. According to their Hyrule Compendium entries, they are spirits who take the form of dragons, each pertaining to a different element. Each dragon guards a different area of Hyrule. That is, when they're in Hyrule. 
As an old saying in Hyrule goes, the dragon ascends to the heavens when the sun begins to set. And wouldn't you know it, that's just what these dragons do when they finish their flights. They fly directly upward until a ring of clouds in the sky appears and they pass through it, disappearing from sight. What if these portals don't lead to a totally separate world, but rather allow the dragons to enter a sky realm connected to Hyrule? It would certainly fit the description of the heavens given in the old saying, full of gates that suggest a sacred nature and looking down on Hyrule from above. Even the fact that it's apparently hidden in plain sight seems quite a lot like the dragons. Only a select few are ever said to have seen them, despite being massive and flying around in the sky. Beyond that, they're simply treated as legends, elusive creatures that hardly ever appear. Back to the sky world, in theory, this would mean that Link at some point must pass through the cloud barrier, likely with the help of the green hand. When on the top side of the barrier, he could see all the islands and ruins, but after passing back beneath, the islands would disappear from sight. This might provide a convenient explanation for travel between these areas, if there are only a few points that you can travel between the sky and the surface. After all, without the Sheikah Slate, fast travel is bound to work differently. Perhaps Link must find spots on the surface that can launch him up that high, allowing him to reach different portions of the sky world. For all we know, we'll have to ride the dragons into the sky to get there. That's just a bit of speculation though, since there's no real way of knowing how travel between these areas will work. Before we move on from dragons completely, let's take a look at the mean green machine here. Up until this moment, I've been referring to this thing as an Igor, since it reminded me of those monsters. As much as I would like it to be that though, I think it also may be dragon themed. For starters, Take a look at the feet slash hands that show up briefly at the bottom of the screen. They have four toes, just like the three dragons do, each tipped with what look like talons or long fingernails. If you look at the holes on its head as eyes rather than the orange dot, it looks even more reptilian, almost like a big lizard. And even though we can't see how tall it is, the middle segment seems to be broken up into pieces, simulating the snake-like appearance of a dragon. Of course, it could be something totally different, but from what we have seen, I can't envision it being a dragon-like machine of sorts. The egg-shaped ornaments we see also could represent dragon eggs, especially with how they look to have scales of some sort on them. And of course, one more dragon-themed item in the trailer was the Dragon Head Flamethrower Shield, which apparently uses the same green spirit energy as the hand and the Igor dragon thing. It also bears some resemblance to the Zonai architecture, and while I'm not too sure how that lines up, I am curious to see. There's one more little thing that gives me hope that dragons will be important in the sequel. If you recall back when the sequel was first announced, Mr. Aonuma mentioned in an interview that a lot of the Zelda team had been playing Red Dead Redemption 2 in response to a question about games that the team might draw inspiration from. However, a detail that often got skimmed over was that he also mentioned Mr. Fujibayashi, Breath of the Wild's director, had been playing Skyrim around that time as well. I don't know much about that series, but I'm pretty sure it has a lot to do with dragons story-wise, so perhaps that will affect the sequel as well. That largely boils down to speculation, however. That one quote really has me thinking. The dragon ascends to the heavens when the sun begins to set. The final shot of the new trailer shows us a view of Castletown, Hyrule Castle floating by Malice, and of course, a beautiful sunset in the background. It seems that this sunset though, dragons won't be the only thing ascending, but will they really end up being a big player in the sequel's story? That remains to be seen. Thank you very much for watching today's video. If you want to get a heads up for any future Zelda theories or videos done by me, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Big thanks to Saber over on Discord for talking over some of this with me. Withstanding my insanity is a difficult task. This may just be the beginning of what's to come, but whatever the sequel holds, I hope it's plenty exciting and even more so to talk about. Once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time you're in the Legend Zone.